with us or against us and you know if you're a punk you have to be progressive in this way and you know how could johnny rotten be pro trump or Dwayne peters or whoever are these like and we're just like wait mind blown how can punk rockers not be liberal you know peace punks right what are you rebelling against what do you got we're trying to change something skateboarding is a way of learning how to read the owners of this country don't care about the poor in the owners. Now, baby, push me. Push me again. Yeah, it's pretty good uh, to be able to transport. Because I like to do it at people's places, like their their yeah. environment. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Thanks for, for being here. This is Noah Levine. Um... For the for the people that don't know who you are, can you uh, talk a little bit about who you are? And, uh... Who am I? <laughs> um, you know, I've been teaching Buddhism. I've been practicing and teaching Buddhism for, you know, practicing for, I just celebrated 33 years of uh, recovery and started meditating when I got into, uh, you know, recovery from addiction 33 years ago. And then eventually that brought me to um, starting to share it with other people. And, and my book, Dharma Punks, was like the first thing that kind of put together all of my thoughts about how punk rock and Buddhism fit together and in my life and, and recovery. Um, and so, you know, for the last 20 plus years, I've been, you know, teaching Buddhism and starting organizations and trying to be of service, trying to like share this stuff that like so totally changed my life uh, with others. Yeah, that's actually uh, how I came to know you back in 2005. I was trying to remember who it was that gave me the book, and uh, I just I couldn't remember. My memory is so terrible. But um, it was at a time when I, I was studying, I guess, more Eastern philosophy. And then when I was locked up, one of the first uh, books that I read that really got me in touch with Eastern philosophy in general uh, was uh, Dan Millman's uh, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which uh, my buddy Sick Boy turned me on to that. Such so, a good book. I remember reading that and loving it so much. I, I, yeah. And it's, it's a little mystical and weird, mystical. but it's so cool. Yeah, especially towards the end when he's like running after the girl through those trails and the mountain thing, and it's just like this. But it was actually like at the time that I got into punk rock, and so for me, right off the bat, see, this is the, the thing, and I'm sure you get this a lot of the times, is that there seems like there would be a contradiction, right, between uh, punk rock and uh, spiritualism or Buddhism. And uh, for me, it makes a lot of sense because as you write about in your book, a lot of it is trying to break down the ego and as a punk rock, you're trying to break down the system in a sense because you know that there's something going on within the system that is not serving you to be happy. And that's like suffering. And we're driven so much by the ego. So all those things like greed that, you know, punk rockers are, you know, that we're about or we're against. Um, so all those things always made sense to me. But for a lot, a lot of people, it just it doesn't connect. And that's I think so I'll, like. On the ride over here, you know, what I, I tend to do is, like, you know, think about, like, the process. Like, no matter what I do, it's, there's nervousness, anxiety, there's fear, there's all these things that can start to build up, and then you start to feel overwhelmed. You're like, I don't, man, I shouldn't be doing this shit. Like, it's too much. It's like, and, um, I mean, I've learned over time, like, that you have to just work through those emotions because those are, a lot of the times, are triggers. And I thought about Alan Watts's quote where he talks about um, you can't really control the mind and the thoughts in that way. And it's really not about controlling the thoughts. It's, like he says, it's like um, trying to smooth out uh, rough waters with an iron. Uh, it's just going to disturb it. And that quote, like, really hit me because... I never understood meditation and it was because of Alan Watts uh, for one guided meditation that I did where it, it made me realize that it's not about the control. It's about letting it happen and realizing, especially if you come from trauma or dysfunction that that's going to be there. And what is going on is like old emotions or old, you know, things that can get triggered. And then you're emotionally, you feel like you're there. Um, and so, Anyway, I uh, 
but yeah, getting back, that's how I found I found you was through Dharma Pucks. What do you? I mean, what is the reception? I guess for the most. I mean, now you're at a, a place where a lot of people know who you are, and um, but like when you meet people and you tell them your story, um, how, how is that most of the time? I don't know. I guess um, it probably depends on the context. You know, like what's what's the situation, or or you know, the context of of who I'm meeting and and the story, but. Uh, you know, certainly, um, I feel like I've I've tried to you know translate you know what you were talking about Buddhism for kind of you know um, alternative <laughs> cultures and subcultures and um, and I, I felt pretty successful at doing that you know with with the communities that I've been able to create, but then also one of the sort of unintentional ways that I feel like I've been of service in some ways is to destigmatize the sort of heavily tattooed, you know, person who people are like, ooh, like, ooh, you know, neck tattoos or whatever. And then you start talking to them about the importance of kindness of like what we do <laughs> and yeah. service. And, and I, I love that, you know, to see people's like, oh, I was, I had such a different, and even in recovery, like speaking at recovery meetings or um, you know, well, people would be like, well, I saw you and I, you know, made an instant judgment of what your story was going to be. And then it totally was different than that. And so, you know, what, I was going to say, even within Buddhism, I mean, because there's so many different sectors of Buddhism and there's sort of different ideas about that. Like, I'm sure that like traditionally, you know, there's Buddhists that are like, what the f who is this guy with all the tattoos? You know what I mean? This is not what I'm oh, used for to. And sure. I, and I feel like that, again, that connects to the punk rock yeah. mentality of challenging, right? Like, especially if you're going to be about that and it's about compassion and not judging. And um, have you run across a lot? Oh, of for that? sure. <laughs> no, for sure. But also, like, I had some nepotism in the Buddhist world because of who my father was. If my father hadn't been a famous meditation teacher, author, uh, they would have never opened the door for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, my father early on, like Jack Cornfield and, you know, um, you know, some other you know, famous teachers were saying, you know, we want you to come. We want you to teach. And um, I, at one point I was they, like this Buddhist magazine, Tricycle, did this article on me in like the late 90s. And I was just like, I was nobody, but I was the son of a famous, you know, meditation teacher. And I asked my father about it at one point. He's like, yeah, well, the name will get you invited. But if you don't have anything interesting to say, matter, yeah. you won't be invited back. Like, if you don't show up with some merit to the table, um, you know, your success was built on what, you know, yes, you had some doors open for you, and you had a pass on being a kind of felon addict, tattooed street kid because your dad was a cool hippie Buddhist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so for sure, and in the, you know, one of the things that's, that's super weird uh, is that in that Buddhist world where 20 years ago when I was starting to teach and, you know, they were like, ooh, like who's like, I don't know, this guy swears and he's tattooed. And, and they were super skeptical. But then when they saw how, Many people came and, uh, you know, young people came and diverse populations came. Opened up the doors, Then, yeah. you know, and in the kind of Buddhist establishment, the places like Spirit Rock, which are just this big money machine business thing, uh, they were like, wait, like he's making us money, like invite him in. And maybe we should get a bunch of other tattooed people to teach here because they have a good sort of like marketing appeal. Mm -hmm. And it became this like... Uh, and it, not so different than in the punk scene where it's like we got tattooed to set ourselves apart and then it became like oh you have to be tattooed to fit in mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and the same thing in the Buddhist world where they were like well let's cash in on the young Dharma punks movement I, th I think that's why I'm, I've always been apprehensive about joining just something because I feel like everything has the potential when you start to gain numbers and notoriety and there's people on a board and there's people making decisions that it tends to be human nature that it just 
it eventually just fucking fucks itself up and that the the human instinct in nature like that all like really like comes out and those things end up not being pure and that was like with buddhism it's like that's why i don't classify myself as a, a as a buddhist or i mean i follow things but i don't you know the four noble truths right like i don't i haven't and there was a time when i was i was really connected when i was going to buddhist temples i was talking to people um i I kind of went down the the road of Taoism and I really identify with Taoism because I don't really there's not a whole lot of structure to it and I, I like that it's just this guidance and they don't even really know who the fuck wrote it you know what I mean it's just like so but I went to um, a Taoist uh, place and uh, I want to say it was San Gabriel so I went there and I, I talked to the the people that sort of ran it and they were like, well, one of the things that you have to do is you have to agree or you you have to uh, basically make a statement that you believe in reincarnation. And I instantly, as a, a person of a rebellion, was I don't want to just admit that because I don't know. I don't know for certain whether that's the thing. So it's like, why does it even matter if I why, like, why do I have to do that? And I think that's what the most you know, organized religions is that there's these guidelines, these rules, but if I'm just living, you know, peacefully, compassionate, like l abiding by, cause I really do think that most religions are basically saying the same thing, but yeah, so you had this, this sort of insight inside to this world. So that actually opened up the door and allowed you in where you may have not had that opportunity before. And then you, you kind of, you, you were able to get in there because of that. I wanted to ask you about your dad. So your dad, Steven, uh, he, he, you said he did time. He did time in prison before he got into that. And it's funny, like looking at pictures and reading about him, I would have never gathered that. And, and he didn't talk about it all that much actually. Yeah. And I, I don't, I didn't really find anything to just cause I kind of wanted to know that experience because because of that experience, he got into it and now you're here and you're, really a byproduct it was i don't think it was as much that experience that turned him on to meditation as it was me that was definitely my story where it was like being locked up got me willing to meditate you know he was he was already interested he had met this like antique dealer named rudy who was like a you know into like eastern mysticism and that was like his first teacher like hanging in the village and and this is like you know 50s and then he, um, you know, he was a weed smoking, beatnik hippie, and uh, had a. He told me like he had a fifty dollar a month like loft in Soho, like you know those Soho lofts that are twenty thousand dollars a month now or whatever they are, fifty bucks artist loft in Soho, and and um, he was uh, he got busted in a weed deal. You know, somebody that he knew was like, hey, you know, sell these couple of pounds of weed for me and, you know, you'll make this much money to pay your $50 a month rent. And, and it was a setup and he did a year on Rikers Island. But he was already practicing. You know, he already had some meditation instruction, so he was able to do that. And it's actually probably that experience that when he got out, he would, it would ended up in San Francisco, Hate ashbury being part of that whole scene. He was the editor for... Uh, Hate ashbury magazine called The Oracle, where which was like the kind of the Grateful Dead and Starship and Ram Dass and, you know, that whole kind of psychedelic music and, you know. Um, and so he was part of that. And then while he was in San Francisco in the late 60s, I was born in 71, he did um, like a couple of years of teaching meditation in San Quentin to death row. And he wrote a book. There's this like out of print book. I'll show you a copy of it. I don't know if I have one here, but I have one at home called Death Row and these kind of like experiences and conversations that he's having wow. with guys, you oh, know, on what? death row yeah. in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, by the time I was born in 71 and then by the time I'm like strung out and locked up in the early 80s. He's like, hey, you know, try meditation. You know, it worked for me. Like, I did time. I, um, and I didn't even really know that about him until later. Yeah. Do you think it's important for individuals um, to have experiences like that in order to understand 
other people because uh, getting back getting back to the religion uh thing is i think a lot of the times like people just kind of grow up in a bubble and they don't have that connection to other people and they they can form ideas about these people um how, do you, how how much of an influence do you think that had on your dad uh, to go through that experience where it allowed him to sort of open up your, I mean, really, actually, you're a perfect exa- example of that because you um, you went through a lot before you got to the point to uh, of understanding for yourself. Um, for the people that don't know, sort of building up to that, and I, don't, I guess I don't want to spend too much time because I'd like to get some insights from you. Uh, but for the people that don't know your journey, can you talk a little bit of, uh, uh, briefly overview? It's, and it, and yeah, if sure. people want to know more, they can, they can, uh, you know, get your, your books, Dharma punks. Cause you talk about it in detail there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the bullet points is, you know, like born into this family with this Buddhist Hindu meditation dad, this mom that was into it too, but was a, you know, a bit of an addict, alcoholic, um, by the time I'm, you know, my parents split when I was two, by the time I'm five, I'm suicidal, like actively thinking about and knowing about reincarnation and thinking like, well, I need to just kill myself and, and oh, start shit. over, yeah. you know, like not like I'm out forever, but like, this is, this is, uh, you know, the road runner getting killed or, or Wiley Coyote getting killed on, you know, cartoons, but they're there again, the next episode. Yeah. So I was like, I'll just take myself out. And then I started getting high at seven. And, you know, by the time I was, I was eating mushrooms at nine, LSD at 10, 11, cocaine at 12. By the time I was a teenager, and I found punk rock in about 19, I guess it was about 80. I was about like around nine years old. I heard punk. And, you know, I had an older sister and I got this tape and there was the pistols on it and Clash and and um, some early, you know, Black Flag or, you know, something. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is what I've been looking for. This music is the kind of voice of how I feel. How you feel. Yeah. <laughs> and so that kind of punk scene but i just got so strung out you know and i'm looking up to sid vicious not siddhartha <laughs> you know i'm looking out up to uh you know self-destructive biker punker you know live fast surf live you know fast, yeah young. yeah surf yeah. punk kids yeah. and um so by the time i'm 17 in 1988 i'm strung out i'm locked up i've got three felonies and it's not, you know, it's going uh, to a direction of, you know, of of die young or be locked up or just be fucking miserable. Mm-hmm. And that was that experience I was talking about my father saying, well, you want to try meditation? And then starting to meditate. How old were you at eight, that point? Uh, 17. You were 17 at that point. 17 yeah. years old, it, sitting in a cell trying to meditate and not being able to do it very well. But I got it right away, that simple mindfulness of breath, of like ignore your mind, pay attention to your breath. You don't stop your mind. You're not gonna quiet it. It's gonna be loud as fuck in the background, but shift your attention to breathing in, breathing out. Let that be your focus. And right away I was like, oh, that's better. I can't do it very well, but at least I'm not in the shame of the past or the terror about what's gonna happen in prison in the future. Yeah. So from there, you know, first couple of years were kind of, you know, slow, slow starting. I was in a group home. I, I, I got sober. I stayed sober. And, you know, thank God for straight edge because, you know, being a drug addict street punk that was a fan of Minor Threat in seven seconds. <laughs> yeah. And then I got sober in 88 and I was like, OK, there's drug free punk rock. And not only that, like some of these punks are starting to go spiritual. And I'm trying to meditate and I'm, you know, going to 12 step programs. They're saying there's a spiritual solution. I was way too much of an atheist to just be like, okay, God help me. Like didn't make sense to me at all. But then, you know, the youth of today guys are becoming Hindus, you know, Hare Krishnas and, you know, starting to see the kind of mindfulness messages in some of the songs. And you were, you were, you were saying earlier about like how, um, you know, the kind of the punk rock and and spiritual or Buddhist, you know, connection that people maybe don't understand that you you've understood for me as like my whole 
youth, my whole life was based on dissatisfaction. Like it can't be like this corrupt, this ignorant, this unfair, this inequitable, this much, you know, just greed and hatred and delusion in the world. And punk rock was like shining the, the, the magnifying glass on, you know, whether it's listening to, you know, Sandinista or whatever it is and just kind of getting that like, um, I just bought that record yesterday. So good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. just like, you know, the sort of social political rebellion that punk is that's fueling my own feelings of dissatisfaction. And this is the Buddha's first noble truth. The, the truth of suffering, dukkha, is also the truth that there's that, that this sort of existence is fueled by greed and hatred and delusion. And that because of that, and because of our reaction to it, we suffer and we create suffering. And so I just felt like, oh no, punk and Buddhism like fit really perfectly because they're founded on dissatisfaction. And there's not, you know, of course it became a religion, but ultimately Buddhism is a DIY movement. The Buddha was saying like, you don't need temples, you don't need religion, you don't need any of this shit. What you need is mindfulness of your own mind of your own emotions, present time awareness, learning to respond differently to the pain in your life, to the pleasure in your life, breaking the addiction. He's like, and you have to do it yourself. <laughs> you don't need a priest. You don't need a ritual. You don't need a meditation temple. Right. You just need your own attention, your own awareness. That actually um, reminds me of something that I heard uh, we were talking about um, or you were talking about like breathing exercises, you were talking about like DMT, like experiences that sort of simulate what you can achieve with like deep meditation and deep connection to spirituality. Because I'm one, I never touched a hallucinogenic and, and I did DMT, but I did it with spiritual intent. And um, I got a lot out of that experience where my ego died it was dead for me a couple weeks after I, I sort of came back from that experience and it, it, it reconnected me to the prior experiences that I had gone to where I saw really clearly. And I think one of the pitfalls with that is it is, I think, as you mentioned before, it's, uh, it can be kind of like a line that you walk that can just crumble un under you like really quickly because you become reliant on just that feeling and because it eventually goes away and then you're left with sort of what you had before because you didn't really go in uh, deep enough. Like, what are your th thoughts on that relating to, I guess, meditation? Because one could look at two of those things as the same thing or deep, deep spiritual work versus the quick fix. You right. Know? I mean, I have all kinds of opinions about psychedelics and drugs and, you know, versus meditation, but I don't really know. Like I'm, you know, I'm somebody who's been sober for 33 years. Um, I took truckloads of LSD as a teenager, but it wasn't with a spiritual intent. Right. I never did DMT. I've never done ayahuasca. So um, I, you know, my, my own, uh, so on some level, I don't know. I don't know how useful it is. Um, or if it's potentially useful for people. It, it didn't feel very useful for me, but I wasn't using it with a intent. Yeah, intentions, um, I mean, intentions a lot. Yeah. I do, you know, as a somebody who's been studying and practicing Buddhism for a long time, I do adhere to abstinence from all recreational, you know, so, you know substances, you know. Um, so sobriety is part of the Buddha's teaching. Now, there's an argument that people are making that like, hey, this isn't recreational. This is medicinal or sacred or whatever they want to call it. You said, and most of the reports that I've heard is that like, yeah, it was very useful. And then it kind of crumbled and I was left with the underlying ego, self, clinging aversion, self-centeredness that we all, you know, that, that there's not a drug that's going to take that permanently away or give us enough insight to really change our relationship is my sense. Mm -hmm. um, Long-term meditation practice wakes us up to awareness, wakes us up to the impersonal nature of our own mind and how, has, how it has a mind of its own. 
and gives us something that's actually reliable to be able to have this relationship to our emotions and our sensations and our thoughts and feelings that I don't think a, a kind of psychedelic experience doesn't, I, I haven't met anybody that said it led to a reliable ongoing transformation that it opened some doors and it gave them some insights, right. but that without, you know, it didn't, didn't I would, last. I would say it's the marijuana of spiritual, uh, a, a spiritual path. Cause I mean, if you're the, the intentions there, I mean, my intentions were there prior to it, but it did make me want to dig deep more into my spiritual path. And that was one it's of a the gate with gateway. It's a gateway. <laughs> it's a gateway. So, I mean, I'm running with that because I mean, to be honest with you, what I experienced in it is everything that uh, every religion teaches. And I think there's a, there's a connector there that allows, and I think a, the connector is getting rid of the ego really ultimately to an attachment because that's what I experienced. That was my ultimate was, the fear of it. I have abandonment issues and you know, a lot of my fear comes from that. So it's like it's attaching myself to things. And this actually relates to, because I was talking earlier that I think we're similar in nature where it's like, I, I attach myself to the thing. I have an addictive personality. So right now, now that I'm, I'm, I've been sober the last month, I'm listening to all straight ed because it puts me in that mindset. Cause I feel the energy of it. I just, I want to be it. And I, and I think it really goes, it, it's deeply rooted in the love of life. And there's almost an attachment to that. Right. And I have found myself over the years. Um, and I was kind of alluding to this earlier about the mask and I would like sort of apply mask and then I would identify with things. And that was one of the things when I went to the first meditation, when I first found out about Dharma Pucks is I had gotten to that point. I was like, man, I like, I joined gangs. I, I dress like a punk. I did like all these different things. And I was just like, I was like, I want to practice on my own. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to find this thing on my own without this, this need to reinforce the identity of it. But, you know, I learned, you know, through time that it's much more than that. Those are my own personal issues. But I, just the attachment to identity and what I think a lot of people go through is that we're so we're so addicted to identity. What is that? How has that been for you, like representing yourself in a, in a, in a way? Because I'll never not listen to punk rock. It's deeply rooted and it's it's a part of me, but then there's that in my, my voice is like, well, that's just like your identity. That's just speak, speak on that. Like to, or what your experience or what your thoughts are on that. You know, my sense is the more we wake up to the constantly changing and permanent nature of all things, including the self, the more we wake up to, uh, that so much of what is happening here is not personal. It's the human survival instinct. It's millions of years of evolutionary biology that is developed into this human form that has this, what we call ego, self, I, me, mine, that identifies, that clings, that hates pain, that loves pleasure, that takes everything personal. It's not personal that you take everything personal, yeah. <laughs> including your fashion including your identity, including your personality. And so the more I've kind of practiced and woken up, it hasn't changed my personality. It hasn't changed my identity. Uh, you know, it hasn't changed my style, hasn't changed my preferences, but it has changed my relationship to my personality. I don't believe that it's my true identity. It's changed my relationship to my body, my gender, my fashion. Um, you know, it's like I'm a recovering addict and there's this sort of thing in 12 step where you're like, my name's Noah, I'm an alcoholic. And people are like, well, isn't that reinforcing the identity of being an alcoholic? You haven't had a drink in 33 years. Like, are you still an alcoholic? Right, yeah. I'm like, uh, I don't believe that that's my identity, but it has been part of my experience in this lifetime. Any more than I believe that my true identity as a straight white American male. That's not who I am. It's what I'm experiencing in this incarnation. Right. 
<laughs> but that's not who I am. That's not my core identity. Uh, I like punk rock. I'm not, you know, maybe, you know, punk rocker, but that's not who I really am. That's just sort of what I, you know, relate to and mm -hmm. this process of, so meditation, Buddhism, awakening, healing, recovering, for me has shifted my relationship to identity. Where I'm still a you know American punker, recovering addict, you know I you know skateboarding, surfing, bikes, hot rods, like all of that stuff is part of my personality and my you know likes, but it's not who I am. I'm not that identified with what I'm identified with. Right. But this other idea that you'll get so fucking spiritual that you won't be identified with anything. And that you'll want to just like wear white and eat kale. Yeah. <laughs> like naked in the woods. Somewhere. Well, and, the, and then, you know, you see the folks that get so identified with wearing white and only eating kale, that becomes their whole identity. Yeah. You see people in Buddhism that because they're studying with Tibetan teachers, they start speaking in broken English like their Tibetan teacher. They put on the beads, they put on the robes, they put on the thing, and they take on the spiritual materialism. I feel like a lot of what I've been trying to do is uh, create an American Buddhist uh, lineage where we're not trying to be Zen. We're not trying to be Theravadan. We're not trying to be Tibetan, right? We're trying to be like American punkers who are kind, who are non-attached, who are non-identified, who believe in generosity and service and, you know, are showing up in the world as we are, not trying to get rid of. But it does internally shift our attitude and outlook upon who we are. Right. I, I definitely can agree with that because, again, I identify with things, but I don't, I'm not a attached to those you know what i mean they just kind of help me in the, the human experience or to really just feel the human experience but know that none of that shit really matters it's just i there's something about it that i love but i'm okay if it weren't there or if it changed forms or if it, and a question that i was going to ask as well was i feel like since there's such a disconnect from spirituality just in general because i think a consumer mindset or a capitalistic mindset is reigning supreme right now um and even within on the other side of that politics and creating this division or in cultures where it's creating more categories creating more division among people where i I felt that the ultimate goal, or what I think is the ultimate goal is to to sort of step away from this idea of identifying ourselves as only this thing and this is what we're gonna be a part of. And if it's something that goes against that, then I'm just gonna shun it and I will ostracize it. And it's it seems so counter to, spe like specifically like my experience in punk rock there seems to be a lot of that going on and I'm not sure what the hell is going on when it comes to that because there's no more, in, for me, we're getting, we're straying away from individual thinking um, and it just, I don't, how does, how do you, like coming from where you have been and your experience and your outlooks and then, you know, intertwining that with your spiritual path, how does one navigate through what is going on today because there has definitely been a shift from from things uh, especially as a punk rocker you know people all the time and maybe for for all times and have this question of like seems like it's getting worse it, it yeah <laughs> it, like it's so much worse than it used to be and um, you know, like, sure, like the Buddha got enlightened way back then, but now like it's impossible because we have cell phones. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, so I just don't know. My sense is that here's what helps me. 
And I hear what you were saying about this sort of binary kind of split and, you know, kind of with us or against us. And, you know, if you're a punk, you have to be progressive in this way. And, you know, how could Johnny Rotten be pro-Trump or Dwayne Peters or whoever are these like, and we're just like, wait, mind blown. How can punk rockers not be liberal, you know, peace punks, right? Um and and how can they you know have these political ideas without um, you know us labeling them as Nazis you know because there's always been the Nazi punks there's always mm-hmm. been some sort of fascist white supremacist movements within the punk scene um, but you know us kind of good punkers don't want to identify with that those are the others right that's why we created sharp and that's why we created you know and anarchy then the sharp, and then the sharp speed up the the punks at the of, shows of and course then, and then it goes yeah. right yeah. um here's what you know the kind of way that buddhism has helped me which is the buddha saw this world he called it samsara and it means a, a realm of perpetually wandering in confusion and that if you're here, if you've incarnated, you are fueled by greed and hatred and delusion. It's in me, it's in you, it's in all of us. Mm. Greed is in the tendency to cling and get attached to pleasurable things. That's greed. Out of control, it becomes, you know, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> right. But we have that same thing in us that I want it to be pleasant and it's pleasant, I want more. Right? Like we all have that. Not just addicts and not just, you know, kind of corporate, you know, wealthy people. So just seeing this world as like, this is the way it is here. Ignorance, self-centered fear, you know, views, opinions, um, you know, easily conditioned by racist ancestors and racist culture that we live in. Like just seeing that as like the, the reality that we're in. And not having very high expectations for people to be wise, for people to be just, for people to be woke. <laughs> you know? And so then when you know, when you hear uh, you know, Dwayne like saying crazy shit on social media, you just say, like, oh, oh of course, like that guy used to be an amazing skateboarder and I liked his band. Yeah. And like he's, you know, saying some wild shit. You know, or 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 like you know, uh, you know Johnny Lydon, like saying crazy shit. Just that attitude of like, rather than being offended by it and against it, and I have to, you know, cancel this person because I don't agree with them, and I think that they're confused. Everybody's a bit confused. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Everybody's That's a bit confused, and so just like giving people a little bit more space. Now, I don't want to say like there shouldn't be consequences, and you know sometimes there should be consequences. And the Me Too movement was so good in so many ways, and parts of cancel culture. It's like about fucking time some of this shit got changed, right. you know. Like so. Um, but then, of course, there's the extremes and then it goes too far. And then, you know, the liberals are attacking each other and you're not Antifa enough and you're not punk rock enough. And, you know, it's been this way always, though. I remember in the 80s, it was like, who are the posers? Who are the real punks? Who are the, you know, yeah. like, It's always been this way. There's always this strife. There is something about social media um, and the access to gossip that is creating a bigger and, you know, more ripple effects. And it's destroying people's lives because all you got to do is post, you know, a couple of things that aren't true about somebody and it'll fucking take them down. And I know I've experienced some of that in my own life and community. And um, for me, I'm in a place where whatever happens, it's my practice. It's my spiritual practice. And so, you know, bring it on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, I want to dismantle the self. I'm, I don't want to defend the self. I want to show up and tell the truth to the best of my ability. And I want to be free. Right. Yeah. And that's not the case for most people that are like, no, I want to be safe. I want to be secure. I want to. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that because. I didn't. I didn't really know about what happened with you with the whole, the whole Me Too thing, and um, like again, I, I don't like to perpetuate the 
that that feeling or that that attitude that I think uh, social media creates in the the sense is like oh that's I want to talk about the juicy shit or like whatever, uh, but I had no idea that you went through that and that's something that I've 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 sort of internalized and processed on my own like because there's people that have been affected by certain things whether it comes to skateboarding about uncovering some shit that was said in a magazine you know a really long time ago and then i know people that were like well fuck that guy fucking uh, let's destroy his fucking life and uh i mean my attitude has always been this or uh, you know at a certain point it was created and this comes from experience this is what i was talking about before i think it's really fucking easy to judge people and to make decisions for other people when you've never met you know, someone like that, that's had this experience, you just have lived in this bubble and it's really fucking easy for you to just point your finger and say, Oh, that's, that's wrong. But everybody, every fucking person on this planet has something that someone else is going to deem, um, not good or, of or whatever. Of course. I mean, this is the Buddha's first noble truth that I was talking about before. All of us have some suffering. And because we suffer because of our craving and our aversion and our self-centeredness, that suffering becomes unskillful actions. Right. Whether it's, you know, cultural or gender bias or whatever it is, we all have that on some level or another. So to attack each other and try to hurt each other behind, and this is like really like woke me up, of like when we're trying to hurt somebody because they're being unskillful, if we just have a little bit of compassion, a little bit of insight, we see, oh, that person's being unskillful because they're suffering, because they're confused. And they're actually worthy of some compassion, maybe some boundaries, maybe some consequences. But to, uh, what we're really doing when, you know, there's the sort of let's cancel, let's, is the kind of like let's hurt somebody who's already so hurting themselves right yeah because there's no <laughs> there's no wisdom and then you know there's not much room for reconciliation and for compassion and forgiveness and a kind of like this is a suffering person who's maybe done some really unskillful things but let's let's give them a chance to heal yeah i mean it's like a, a child like when a child does something if you're a good parent or if you're a compassionate caring parent I've never told my daughter, like, go in the corner, you're fucking crying, I don't want to deal with you, yeah. or you did this, I don't, you're just... Get go, out. Get out. Yeah. I'm no longer I don't care feeding if you're you. nine years old, yeah, get, get the out. fuck out. Yeah, go, find your own food and shelter. <laughs> but I really feel like it's really the same thing, because a lot of us are, we're still chill, like, we still deal with the same i'm still dealing with certain traumas that i dealt with when i was younger of course and i haven't fully obtained the ability to get away from that or 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 be enlightened you know the more we actually look at our own minds the more we like don't believe our own shit right. and the people that are attacking each other on you know social media haven't looked at their own minds enough to have the humility to be like yeah. this is just a view and an opinion and you know i mean that having been said of course racism is wrong of course sexism is wrong of course all of the kind of ways that we oppress each other it's wrong right but people who have racist views are also worthy of compassion. People who have sexist conditioning are also worthy of a, a healing of that rather than just like you're a bad person because you were taught some wrong shit and believed it. And we're going to now, you know, we want to kill you because you're confused. It's like, no, actually, how about healing? How about education? How about support? How about reconciliation? How about actually creating a positive change rather than just bringing more hate and you know to the table, which is mostly what's happening? Right. As I hate you because you hate. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you know, hate, hate. I hate. Hate. It reminds me of uh, love it. You. Uh, love they're going to be playing uh, November at uh, Old Town Pub in Pasadena. Love it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is, I think, when you kind of give yourself up to, I think, service or, or if you carry a certain philosophy, this is, this is why I started doing this, why I want to get more uh, interactive with what's going on in prisons. My brother's doing time. Um, and you, 
after all those years of, of going through the process, service, this is what I'm finding out, especially talking to each individual, different people, different backgrounds, different philosophies, they end up, it's like they learn something and then they share it. So a big part of your journey has been you uh, giving yourself up to for service. Um, just really quick as we end, because I know that you got to take off. Uh, thank you again for fitting me in and uh we kind of had to reschedule a little bit of time for this so i really appreciate you doing that um and it was cool to hear you talking to people you know what i mean like uh with the refuge recovery um and so you're doing a lot of that what is what exactly is that and uh talk a little bit yeah thanks we didn't talk that much about refuge you know my own recovery brought me you know to buddhism and you know and then there's the 12 steps and the 12 steps are very judeo christian theistic very open minded in their theism in their god you know uh uh perspective open minded but still very kind of judeo christian theistic uh, and Buddhism is non-theistic, and I just liked Buddhism better, right? There's no God in Buddhism. There's no external. It's that, what I was saying earlier about DIY. You're an addict? Here's how you can recover based on your own actions, not belief, not faith, not some divine intervention. But if you practice mindfulness, if you develop forgiveness and compassion, you will heal the underlying wounds that created the addiction in the first place, and you will find some freedom and some some refuge and some um so i'm totally all in with that organization refuge recovery.org is the website for people who want to check in meetings here in los angeles we have meetings you know like 12 meetings a week all over the country there's meetings so people can find them they're peer led there's meditation in the meetings um so I'm doing that, and I'm running the Against the Stream where we're sitting, Against the Stream Meditation Center here in Venice, where I teach a weekly class. I host a bunch of other groups, recovery groups. I do a retreat. I've got a retreat coming up October 10th through 17th, a seven-day retreat out in Joshua Tree. Uh, and I offer courses. You know, This is where people who aren't addicts can come to learn about Buddhism mm. and practice meditation and be with the sort of Against the Stream Dharma Punks crew. Um, so refuge recovery and against the stream, that's, that's what I'm working on these days. Okay. Uh, one last question for you. Um, what does it mean to be free for you? To be free is, um, to respond to pain without aversion. So when something freedom from meeting pain with hatred, which creates suffering. So, free from suffering is the ultimate. And so that means that when something pleasant is happening, free from attachment, non-attached appreciation of that pleasant experience. When something painful is happening, compassionate response to that pain. And when life is neutral, when there's neither pleasant nor unpleasant, being able to be bored, <laughs> being able to be at ease in the quiet moments without instantly picking up the phone, instantly turning on the television, instantly seeking some pleasure, and learning to just be at ease in, with what is. That's freedom from suffering. And in order to do that, we have to learn that, that our mind is not who we are, and that we have to be free from identification with, I am my thoughts. And we have to see thoughts just think themselves. The heart beats all by itself. The lungs breathe all by themselves. The human mind produces views and opinions all by itself. Don't believe them all or you'll suffer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, that's freedom. That is freedom. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Noah. I really appreciate it. It was good to meet you again um, and get some insight, deeper insight. Happy to, yeah, it. happy to show up. Thanks for having me on yeah. the podcast. All right. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe this uh, to this podcast. And like uh, Nova was saying, uh, against the stream is yeah. that your podcast that you do? Is that like a yeah? There's an a, there's an against the stream podcast okay. and a refuge recovery and podcast. Okay. So if people want to search those on the platforms, okay. they'll find yeah. them. <laughs> but heard. like and subscribe to this one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it.
For sure. Is that an anti nowhere league tattooed on the inside? No, oh, those are just the, oh. Buddha eyes. Was, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking of the the Cleopatra. They were on anti nowhere oh, right. league. Was on the Cleopatra Records label. Oh, did they have those? And then, oh, Cleopatra, right, right. Yeah, it was I was in qu- quick antidote outtake. <laughs> um, I was in Thailand in '95 at my first Buddhist monastery. And I was, you know, whatever, I was 24 years old or something. And I showed up to this Buddhist monastery, and I was thinking about becoming a monk. And um, I saw this, you know, Western, I think he was, you know, maybe English, you know, European monk in full robes with this huge anti-nowhere league tattoo down his arm. And I was like, I'm in the right place. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that was, that's interesting. So I read, um, I, well, I listened to your audio book. And I also discovered a hack. You can, uh, I, I put your, your voice to like 2.0 and I got through a nine hour book <laughs> in like four hours. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my hack. I'm going to get through a book a day now. But, People have uh, been telling me about, that, about meditation. <laughs> They're putting meditation on one and a half to get through them. It's cheating, people. It's cheating. <laughs> Slow down. Oh, Normal speed yeah. is fast enough. <laughs> I was just gonna say you never saw that guy. That was it. You saw him for that saw brief. And I never got to talk to him. Just kind of disappeared, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh man, that's uh, that's cool. Maybe All it right. was an apparition. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> what are you rebelling against? What do you got? We're trying to change something. Skateboarding is a way of learning how to redefine the world around you. The owners of this country don't care about the poor and the old. Now, baby, push me. Push me again. Now.